Great. All right, we're ready to get started then. Um, my name is Daryl Griffin, and I'm with IEEE USA, and we are here to present uh, our webinar, The Formula for Predicting a Successful Retirement. Um, our speaker today is Bob Rensfuss. I hope I, I, I know I, I butchered that, uh, Bob, you have to excuse me. Uh, and um, I'm going to read a brief introduction about him. Uh, uh, Bob is uh, a regional manager of retirement services with Transamerica Retirement Management. He puts his experience and knowledge of retirement to work every day by assisting people seeking answers about how to retire successfully. Bob has dedicated nearly his entire career to the uh, retirement industry beginning a decade ago when he started his financial planning practices. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bob. Just one housekeeping note that this, uh, or two housekeeping notes, this uh, uh, session is being recorded and also they would like to hold off questions until the end of the um, until, until the end of the presentation, but you're happy to sort of type them in the chat pod that everyone has access to uh, as we go along and we'll get all, to them all at the end of the session. Uh, Bob, you can take it over. Bob, I cannot see you on camera. If you want to turn your camera on, oh, there you go. Take over. Thanks, Daryl. I appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I just uh, want to get started by saying I'm really happy to be here uh, with this group again. Uh, we, we really uh, enjoy the relationship that we have and, and really going to spend the next uh, 45, 50 minutes talking about the, the key topic that we, we came to discuss, which is really that formula for how do you predict uh, a successful retirement. And retirement today looks a lot different than it did uh, when our parents uh, retired, right? You know, it's no longer uh, the way it used to be. It's much more of a do-it-yourself situation. And that's the cool thing about retirement nowadays is that uh, retirement visions today look uniquely different, meaning, you know, what you envision your retirement to be will be completely different than what your neighbor or your coworker or your friend uh, has in mind for their retirement. And the problem isn't lack of information that's out there. The problem exists is that, so what does this mean for me? In fact, if you Google the word retirement, you'll find that there's 1.47 million results. So it's not lack of information. It's lack of, so what does this mean to me? So we're going to spend the balance of our time uh, helping to cover off on a couple of the key areas that we believe are important to retirement so that you could begin to formulate and build this framework of understanding about what the heck this stuff means to you. Uh, like that warm introduction said, uh, my name is Bob, uh, and that's okay. That's one of the better pronunciations of my last name. My last name's Regenfuss. I guess my folks figured with a last name like that, I need an easier first name like Bob to balance it out. Uh, and I work for Transamerica Retirement Management. And you may be looking at me now that we're doing this whole web, uh, webcam, web sharing thing, going, boy, that guy looks a little young. What the heck does he know about retirement? And that's okay. Uh, I get it. Uh, I, I get it off. Uh, don't let my uh, don't my let, let my boyish good looks fool you. Uh, I've been doing this for quite some time. Uh, I've got all the sorts of licenses and registrations, all that type of stuff, which is really just a uh, fancy way of saying I'm licensed and qualified to be in front of you folks to talk to you about retirement. So I've got a lot of experience and expertise uh, helping thousands of people make this transition to and through retirement. But more importantly, what we want to bring with you and share with you today is the experience and knowledge of Transamerica, a name well, uh, really well known and respected in the uh, retirement business space that has over 170 years of doing this stuff. So we want to share some of that experience, knowledge, and expertise with you. Uh, since we retire every day, we help people through this every day. Uh, I always like to get started, you know, how are you feeling about your retirement? There's a whole bunch of things that may be going through your mind. You might be anxious, you might be a little bit intimidated, you might be confident or you might be excited. You know, you're probably feeling a whole range of these emotions. But generally, when I go out and talk to these people, there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of intimidation that people feel about making this transition both to and through retirement. Well, you're not alone. Uh, our retirement counselors tell me that most folks are feeling anxious and intimidated about this transition. Well, and why is that? Well, it's because it's new to them, right? Uh, think about the transition you made going into the workforce. You know, it was new, unknown world to you, and now you've become very comfortable with that. As you make that transition to your retirement, it may be something new and unknown. So if you have a little bit of anxiety or a little bit of, are feeling a little bit intimidated, don't worry about that. Uh, you know, hopefully by the end of today's presentation, we'll get, get you more moved to that confident and excited stage. So how much planning have you done for retirement? I want you to think about this conceptually. The nice part about this is this is all anonymous. You know, maybe this is your first step. Maybe you already have some ideas. 
uh, or perhaps you already have a formal written plan. Regardless to where you're at on this, on this scale, uh, by the end of today, I think you're going to be able to move that ball farther down the court. Right? So if this is your first step, great, congratulations, you're making a significant step forward. If you already have some ideas or have a formal written plan, take some of the tools and information that we're going to offer you today and incorporate that. You know, studies tell us that most people spend more time planning a two-week vacation than they do their retirement. So uh, if you haven't necessarily been on the ball with retirement planning, that's okay. Uh, most people do it as they get closer and closer to it. So uh, we're going to make some strides forward with that today. So the new reality of retirement is that things have changed. Things are different, right? You know, four out of four people plan to retire, but actually only one out of four people have a plan for retirement. And for many of that 25%, it's simply that they just hope that they save enough into their retirement plan at work. And between that and any sort of pension or Social Security they may have, that they're going to be okay. But unfortunately, retirement planning isn't something you can just wing. You need to go into it with a little bit of forethought and a little bit of knowledge about that. Uh, and in your defense, if you haven't done a whole lot of planning, you know our industry and a lot of people in our business have, have made this uh, a little more complicated than it needs to be. So it all really boils down to understanding your choices, your options, and what goes into it so you can make good decisions for yourself. So from this day forward, I no longer want the words retirement planning or financial planning to scare you or intimidate you any longer. It just boils down to understanding what your choices and options are uh, for you to make good decisions for yourself. Uh, generally, I like to ask folks, as you think about other people who have retired, you know, friends, coworkers, uh, family members, whatever it might be, Ask them about what, you know, how that went for them. You know, there's a lot you can learn from those folks, either good or bad. Uh, you know, from folks who have done it right, they'll be, they'll be happy to sh share with you what they've, uh, what they've done really successfully. For folks who have maybe made some mistakes or shortcomings along the way, um, they'd be happy to tell you too. Maybe it wasn't even a personal mistake. Maybe they just timed their retirement wrong. Think about your friends or coworkers who retired in 2006 or 2007 and then encountered some of the markets like 2008 or even some of the ones now. So what can you already learn from people who've already retired? Uh, ask them because a lot of times that, that has a good way of hit, hitting you between the heart or between the eyes and make you think about this stuff. But no longer should the words retirement planning scare you or intimidate you anymore. So the goal of our time today really are these three things. First, I wanna give you some clarity and some confidence about uh, what it takes to not only get to retirement, but to get through retirement. And if you happen to be one of the fortunate members on this call who's already retired, how to live potentially better in retirement. The second thing we want to cover off on is I want to begin to give you the right questions to ask uh, and help to assist you with the right decisions that you need to make, which ultimately then will lead you to, okay, you need to find the right resources for you because retirement is such a customized, personalized thing to you, right? Your vision of retirement is different than your friends or your neighbors or your coworkers. So what's right for them may not be right for you, you need to find the right resources for you. Ultimately, we want to answer the one simple yet challenging question. Can I afford to retire? If not now, when? And if now, how the heck do I do it? So we really believe that there's five key areas that you need to be thinking about as it relates to this whole retirement picture. The first is your lifestyle. What do you want to do? How are you going to spend your time? What's going to bring you happiness? Second are investments. What are the financial resources you have to support that lifestyle? Third uh, is healthcare, right? This is one where a lot of people have a lot of questions. How do you recreate your healthcare benefits uh, and navigate these wild waters of Medicare and supplemental Medicare program and make sure you make the right decisions for yourself? Fourth is protection. How do you make sure nothing can come along and sabotage or derail your best laid plans? And last but certainly not least is income. How do you optimize and maximize the amount of income that you get and make sure it lasts throughout your retirement. Now we believe you need good answers in all five of these areas or whatever your vision of retirement is, uh, potentially in jeopardy. Think about it as a puzzle with a missing piece. All five of these are interrelated. So we believe you need answers in all five of these areas. Uh, for our time today though, uh, we're only gonna cover off on a couple of them. We're gonna hit a couple of the main topics that we most commonly hear about and that's healthcare and income. Uh, so those are, we're gonna talk about two of the five key areas today. And I urge you and encourage you to take advantage of some of the other uh, options that are available to you to explore the other three options with us as well. Okay, so as it relates to healthcare in retirement, this is undoubtedly where folks have the most questions, right? And rightfully so. You know, did you know that there's a dozen different 
supplemental Medicare plan options uh, available currently. And there's 12 different options to choose from, from you know, hundreds if not thousands of carriers. So no, no wonder this is a confusing area, right? Most people we get a chance to talk to didn't spend most of their careers as benefits directors or, uh, or HR managers their entire career. So this is new to them, right? Up until this point, you've probably relied on your employer to help narrow down this field of options uh, for you to choose from. Well, as you transition into retirement, that's something that you're gonna to need to take on yourself. Now, I know that you can do it. It just all goes, uh, it all boils down to understanding what your choices are, uh, having it presented to you in a clear, concise way so that you can make a good decision for yourself, right? So most notably, where we begin talking about healthcare and retirement is, first, you need to get an understanding of, you know, what are the benefits that you and your family use today? What are the benefits that are available to you tomorrow? So thinking things like if you've got retiree health benefits available to you through your employer, uh, perhaps you're a veteran and have some uh, military benefits available to you. Uh, maybe you're part of a membership or a union or an association that offers some sort of benefits. So understanding what your coverage options are, because then you can identify any gaps. So most commonly where people uh, have questions is around Medicare. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But first, uh, I want to ask you, if I were to ask you today, what percentage of current retirees do you think have a prescription drug plan? Is it 15%, 39%, 52%, 76%? What would you guess? Do you have an answer in mind? Well, the answer is actually 39%. Hmm, maybe that was less than you thought. Well, maybe we can uncover why that is. Let's take a look. Let me ask you this one more question. So if I were to ask you, what does the average retiree pay for their prescription drug coverage on a monthly basis? Does it cost them $100 a month? Is it $40 a month, $20 a month, $70 a month? What would you guess the average retiree today is paying for prescription drug uh, plan premiums? Well, the answer is $40 a month. Was that less than you thought? Most likely. Uh, when I've gone out and talked to people in an in-person situation, I often find, oftentimes find that 70 to 80% of the room will think that healthcare or prescription drug costs are more expensive than it actually is. You know, I happen to live in Minnesota and I like to say this, do you think that if more retirees knew that the average prescription drug plan was only about $39 a month, that more or only about $40 a month, that only 39, more than 39% of retirees would have it? You betcha. Now you betcha more people would have it. But people uh, get, their perceptions get in the way of reality, right? So they perceive prescription drug plans or they prescribe, uh, perceive healthcare plans to be really expensive, so they don't even go in exploring what their options are. So no longer from this day forward should your perceptions get in the way of a reality, right? So understand that the average prescription drug plan is only about $40 a month, uh, should encourage you to, to explore some of those options. In fact, you know, if you're just willing to go to a Target or Costco or Sam's Club or whatever it is exclusively Walgreens, there's prescription drug plans out there for as little as $12 or $14 a month. So you just have to find what's the right coverage for you. And let me share with you just uh, a, a quick story uh, that is relating to health care planning in retirement. And this story is uh, pretty personal to me. It's about my Aunt Connie. Now, Aunt Connie's a little bashful, so she doesn't let me show a picture of her to national audiences. Uh, but this picture reminds me of, of my Aunt Connie's story because I was at her house last 4th of July. So not this past year, but the year before. And Aunt Connie was 63 years old. Uh, she's worked at the same place for about 30, 35 years. And for the past, I don't know, four or five years, she's really started to hate her job. Now, I know that's not a problem with any of you or any of your colleagues, but with her, it was. She really didn't like her job anymore. But we were over at her house, and she said, family, I got an announcement to make. Uh, I put my, pa my papers in. I'm officially retiring at the end of this year. And everybody said, oh, congratulations. That's great. And a lot of the normal conversation took place. You know, what are you going to do? She said she's going to spend more time with her kids and grandkids and do some more stuff in the garden and, and whatnot. So after dinner, I went up to Aunt Connie and said, hey, Aunt Connie, that's great. Congratulations. I'm really happy that you're retiring. But can I just ask you one thing? Because everybody always has questions uh, for me about health care. So can I just make sure, are you okay with your health care stuff? And she said, Bob, don't be, don't be silly. Uh, I'm going to do what all retirees do. I'm going on Social Security and I'm going on Medicare. And I said, uh-oh, Aunt Connie may have missed some calculations, right? Do you know when Medicare eligibility begins? Right, it's age 65. So this is a problem if Aunt Connie's only age 63. 
Uh, now, everything worked out okay for Aunt Connie, and she was done working where she was working at because she really didn't like her job. Uh, but she ended up getting a part-time job to pay for benefits to bridge her to Medigap, or to Medicare, right? So the point being, in the moral of that story is because Aunt Connie hadn't considered uh, her health care plan as an overall part of her retirement plan as much as she should, her vision of retirement changed like that, right? So if you or your spouse is going to be younger than age 65 when you retire, you just need to figure out how you're going to bridge that gap. Again, retiree health benefits, maybe you get a personal plan, um, maybe you work part-time, whatever it might be. If you, if you are going to retire before age 65, you need to figure out how you're going to get to Medicare eligibility. And that includes if you have a younger spouse, right? Because Medicare only covers one person. It doesn't cover two. So if you're going to be under age 65 when you retire, figure out how you're going to bridge that gap. If you are over 65, though, then you've got to enter the wide world of Medicare, right? So here's a current snapshot of uh, parts A through D. Right, so Medicare Part A, this pays for your hospital insurance. It comes to you complimentary uh, for being a good tax-paying citizen your entire career. Part B is your medical insurance. This uh, uh, pays for doctor services and things like that. Uh, parts A and B are sometimes referred to as traditional Medicare. You know, have you, have you heard them called that? It's called traditional Medicare as Part A and B. Uh, part B, premium, on average right now is about $115 a person uh, per month. Uh, it does de depend if, you, if you're on the higher end of the income scale, perhaps your premium will be a little bit higher. But the average retiree right now is paying about $115 a month for Part B. So Part A and B, traditional, uh, traditional Medicare, government-run programs through government-run agencies. Uh, Medicare Advantage plans, uh, you may know them under their less commonly known name as Medicare Part C. Uh, you still have to have A and B, but instead of being through government-run programs, the coverages that you get that come through uh, private uh, private insurance carriers. Uh, and you should know that the average person who's, who's getting Part C, and you still have to pay your Part B premium. Uh, and if you want Part C to get the private coverage, I think it's usually an additional, uh, on average, 40 to $45 a month for that. And we've already talked about Medi Medicare Part D. That's the prescription drug plans that, that helps pay for medications and doctors prescribe. And again, Average cost for that is about $40 a month, but you can get plans less than that. Uh, so these are really kind of the, the Medicare A, B, C's, and D's. But unfortunately, for probably most of the folks that are looking in and listening into this right now, just having any combination of these um, four options may not quite be enough, right? Because this is really our nationalized health care plan. So there's a lot of gaps. There's a lot of loopholes. There's a lot of things it doesn't cover. So for, the, for, for most people, they're going to need some sort of supplemental plans out there. To help, uh, uh, to help fill in those gaps. Before we move on to that, one quick thing to note is that uh, is this. You may want to jot this down, right? So open enrollment in Medicare is plus or minus three months of your 65th birthday. So plus or minus three months of your 65th birthday. Also, annually, there's an open enrollment window uh, that goes from October 15th to December 7th. So October 15th to December 7th. Uh, so we're right in the heart of that window right now. That, that Those dates just changed last year. Uh, the enrollment period used to go until December 31st, but now it's cut off at December 7th. Uh, so I, sometimes I'll get asked, why is that? Uh, it's because benefits become effective January 1. And it was uh, an administrative nightmare for them to have open enrollment until the 31st and then have benefits take, take effect on the 1st. So October 15th to, uh, to December 7th. So let's talk then a bit about the current world of supplemental Medicare policies. You may know these a bunch of uh, a bunch of different names: um, Med Sup plans, Supplemental Medicare, Medigap, uh, Medicare Cost Programs are really all names of the, of the same bird. Uh, and, they, and this is what the current state of Medigap looks like. Now, you may be looking at this slide going, "Oh my gosh, how am I supposed to navigate that?" Well, if you take a look. On the left-hand side, we've identified just uh, you know, a, a quick laundry list of some of the more common gaps that Medicare has. You know, Co-pays, blood, uh, foreign travel, things like that. So you've got a lot of different plans to choose from. Uh, we generally start by narrowing down three different questions to ask. First, uh, do you plan to live in multiple states? Right. So where I live in Minnesota, a lot of retirees don't like to <laughs> winter 
in Minnesota. So they might move down to Florida or Nevada or someplace else. If you're going to live uh, outside the state for more a period of 60 or 90 days and have two residences, uh, you're going to need some supplemental coverages because Medi uh, traditional Medicare doesn't fly over state lines, meaning you may find yourself in an out-of-network type of coverage, which would be much more expensive for you. Second, do you plan to travel internationally? Right? Mexico doesn't accept Medicare, so if you're going to travel internationally, you're going to need some sort of supplemental policy there. And then the third question we'll commonly ask is, do you like having your preference of who your primary care physician is, or are you okay being kind of a, in a network plan, seeing whoever, whatever? So if, the, if you have a preference on that, that may help to filter down these choices. Uh, if you don't have a resource to turn to, uh, now through uh, IEEE, you can certainly contact us. We have a whole team of specialists that all they do uh, is help people figure out what, what's the right plan for them and how do they, how do they redo that. If you're curious, the most commonly purchased supplemental Medicare plan is F. And, you know, why is that? If you take a look down the list, uh, it generally covers most of those gaps. So it probably most closely replicates many of the coverage that you have today. Uh, the average healthy 65-year-old is paying somewhere between $90 to $95 a month uh, for plan F. And I know we've started talking a lot about terminology and dollars and things like that out there. Uh, but we'll come back to that in just a minute. So this is a current state of what the uh, supplemental Medicare plans are. Now, if your primary residence is in Minnesota, Massachusetts, or Wisconsin, uh, your plans come under a little bit different name. They're called Medicare cost programs. They're not labeled uh, A through N, uh, but you still have to explore what's the right thing for you. You know, and uh, recreating your health care benefits is something that everybody's got to do. Because if you don't, there can be some significant co consequences to it. Uh, actually, according to the 2009 census, uh, approximately 63% of folks who declared bankruptcy said it was because of unexpected health care costs. Right? So don't get so frustrated that you just leave this out there. You just need to understand what your choices are and help you put that stuff uh, into place. So evaluate your retiree health insurance benefits, determine how you're going to cover health care expenses, and know your A, B, C's, and D's, and E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, uh, up until now, and we'll see where we go from there. Um, but recreating your healthcare benefits can be a lot more easy than you think. Right? If, we, if we go back to just some of the numbers we've thrown out there today, it makes it a little bit less daunting and intimidating. Right? So if we take uh, into effect that A comes to you complimentary, uh, Part B, let's say the average is $115 a month. Part, uh, you know, let, let's say you have Part D, so you got a prescription drug plan, and the average is $40. Now we're up to $155. And then let's say you have F, which is, let's say, $95. So what does that get us to? $250 a, a person per month? That probably pretty closely replicates what type of payment you're making now covering you or you and your family. So it doesn't have to be burdensome. Now, I just use F as an example because, you know, what the right policy for you is is, is up to you to figure out what that is. Um, Medicare does make a... a they call it a handy guide as it, as it relates to this stuff. Uh, it's called Medicare uh, Medicare New, Medicare Made Easy. It's 139 pages long. Uh, I know it because I had to read the whole thing. Uh, but you can go out and find a lot of these resources on your own. So if you go out to the Internet, there's a whole lot of good information about that. Uh, but if you want help figuring out what this means to you, uh, I would encourage you to seek out somebody who, who does this stuff on a regular basis. So if the person that you're already working with isn't that person, you can certainly call us. There's no obligation, anything like that. It's all about helping you understand uh, what your options are and what your resources are. We partnered up with a, a provider that offers strategies in all 50 states from a variety of different carriers whose uh, you know, sole aim is to help you figure out what the right plan is for you. So if you didn't have anybody before today, now you do. Now you've got somebody who can help you out figure out this, this wide world of Medicare. Okay. So let me give you a, a, a decision that you need to make uh, and an action step to take out of here from the healthcare section. All right, so the decision that you need to make is, what's the right amount of coverage for me and my family, and how am I going to put that into place? What's the right amount of coverage for me and my family, and how am I going to put that into place? Okay, and your action step here is this. Is that if you're under age 65, uh, I want you to go out to whatever calendar you have, uh, plus or minus three months, or, so minus three months of your 65th birthday, and write down, enroll in Medicare. Enroll in Medicare, right? Now, if you're 65 or older, uh, 
I encourage you to go out and seek out what are some of those supplemental plans, supplemental options. If you're still working and over age 65, work very closely with your HR folks to make sure that your plan is optimized. Sometimes uh, employers have some incentives for you to uh, make Medicare your primary where your uh, employer insurance becomes your secondary coverage. So if you're 65 and older and still working, seek out your uh, help from your HR folks, your human resource folks, to figure out um, how do you optimize and maximize the benefit plans that you have. Fair enough? All right. So then next, let's talk about income. And when we think about income in retirement, we want to think about how do you optimize the amount of income that you get to make sure it lasts as long as you do, right? We want you to have a sustainable spending amount, right? Because sometimes we'll run into folks whose plans for income in retirement sound something like this. Uh, I'm just going to continue spending what I've been spending uh, until it runs out and I'm going to deal with it then because I'll be old. I'm going to spend what I've been spending until it runs out and deal with it then. That doesn't sound like a very successful strategy to me for having sustainable spending in, uh, in retirement. So we want to talk about how do you recreate your paycheck and make sure it lasts throughout your lifetime, right? And most commonly where that starts is Social Security. Probably for most folks who are attending this, uh, this call and this webinar, uh, your, your, your full retirement age uh, is probably somewhere between 66 and 67, right? You know, you get that statement in the mail three months before your birthday that says, you know, here's your estimated benefit. Uh, your full retirement age is this. And you say, thank you, Social Security Administration, for letting me know when my full retirement age is. Um, and you go forward from there, right? So Social Security eligibility begins uh, probably for most of, these, most of us between 66 and age 67. Uh, you can begin taking Social Security, though, as early as age 62, right? So 62, you can begin taking Social Security. When can you start taking Medicare? Age 65, right? They're different. Right, and actually according to the Social Security Administration, 74% of Americans take Social Security early. Now that number might be slightly inflated right now because of current economic conditions and things like that. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, a lot of people are taking Social Security early. And I may be the first person to tell you this. Uh, taking Social Security early isn't a bad decision. It's not a good decision. It's just simply a decision for you. So you need, to, you need to figure out what's the right decision for you. If you do take Social Security early, though, there's just a couple of things you need to know, right? So if you take Social Security early, the amount that you get for a Social Security check every month uh, will be less than had you waiting, waited to take it until your full retirement age or beyond, right? And it can be significantly less. So if your full retirement age was supposed to be age 66, you start collecting the age 62, the amount that you get every month could potentially be 30 to 35% less than what it would have been had you waited until a full retirement age. Now, if you delay taking Social Security, uh, the amount of benefit that you get could potentially go up, right? Because Social Security is calculated by taking into account your highest 35 earnings years. So potentially you'll probably make a little bit more money later in your career, uh, which may replace one of the lower income earning years. Uh, thus resulting in a potentially higher benefit. So you can begin taking age 62. You can delay it up until age 70. If you're over age 70, you might as well start taking it because there's no uh, uh, incentive anymore for delaying taking it. Uh, but again, you may want to work, uh, work that out with your tax professional if it might start, might start to cause you some problems there. But if you do take Social Security early, there's just a couple of things you need to know. Namely, uh, if you still continue to work, your amount of Social Security benefit may be less than what you had anticipated, right? So a lot of people may say, you know, um, Bob, Transamerica, we, uh, I'm going to take Social Security as early as I can because it might not be there. And I'm going to continue to work, so I'm kind of double dipping the system, which sounds like a great, great plan, right, a great strategy. But when you take a look at the look under the hood of that a little bit, you might see that that may not be the most beneficial thing for him. And this is the reason why, is because there's these pesky things out there called earnings limits that you could bump into. Right, so if you're under full retirement age and you start to earn more than fourteen thousand one hundred and sixty dollars a year, um, your social security benefit will be less, and it may potentially be a lot less. So they'll withhold one dollar in benefits for every two dollars in earnings above that. Namely, you know, your social security benefit may potentially be cut in half or more 
if you start to earn more than $14,000 a year. Next, if you're in the year in which you reach your full retirement age, you can earn significantly more, uh, $37,680 to be exact for 2011. Uh, and the reduction is less, so once you go over that, the reduction is the third. Uh, but once you attain your full retirement age, you can earn as much as you want to, and there will be no reduction in your Social Security benefit. I'm not looking at you to become an expert on all of these numbers. What I am looking for you to learn is conceptually, if I continue to work while receiving Social Security and I'm under my full retirement age, I just need to be aware that there's some income limits that I might bump into that could potentially uh, lessen my Social Security benefit. Make sense with me? Great. So then the next component to uh, Social Security uh, is Social Security and taxation. Now, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a CPA, so don't take this as specific tax advice. What I just want to do is frame up uh, Social Security and Social Security taxation to you and show you a little bit of how that works. You may be looking at this going, wow, that's a lot of moving parts on, on one slide here for me to anticipate. But let me see if I can simplify this for you. Really, there's three moving parts of this. First is, do you file individually or jointly? The second part is, is how much income do you earn? And the third part is, what percentage of your Social Security benefits is taxable? So for example, if I take a look at this, I look down on the bottom left-hand side. Uh, so a couple who files jointly that makes more than $44,000 a year, up to 85% of their benefits may be taxable. So let's walk through that just a little bit. So let's say that they're, uh, a couple makes $46,000 a year, and their Social Security benefit is $100 a month to keep the math easy. <laughs> so up to 85% of the benefits may be taxable. So $85 of the $100 Social Security benefit may be taxable. Let's say that they're in the 10% tax bracket. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, so their tax liability on their Social Security uh, in that example would be $8.50. Right? Really the moral of that story is, is that you, know, you have to account for part of your Social Security check probably going to pay some income taxes on that income. And then you'll see that the, uh, the definition of what Social Security Administration defines as, uh, as your adjusted gross income uh, is laid out there. But seek out professional help with your tax preparer to help figure out how all that stuff, uh, stuff works for you. But I just want to generally frame it up to you to let you know Social Security may be taxable to you, so it plays a role in how you rec recreate your paycheck. Right? So that's, then we're telling kind of the nuts and bolts of it. Bob, how do we go about rebuilding our income strategy. How do I go about recreating my paycheck? Well, this is really the way that you do it, right? It begins with understanding uh, what your desired lifestyle will cost. You know, So either if you're a very analytical person who likes going out and doing a budget, who understands the ins and outs of all that stuff, this is one way to, to, to do that. There's an easier way that a lot of people are gravitating towards now is uh, getting something called a retirement spending projection run for them, which basically says, you know, based on what you've got saved for retirement, this is how much you can spend, which will help to define what that desired lifestyle is. Uh, then, once you understand what your desired lifestyle spending is, uh, then you just need to start stacking up whatever sources of income you have. Most commonly, that begins with Social Security. Next, you layer on top, you know, maybe you're fortunate enough to have a pension, uh, Part-time work, maybe you're pulling some equity out of your house, maybe you've got some uh, rental income or real estate investment income that's providing you some, some sustainable income. Whatever it is, you take those things and lop them on top of each other because those are really the beginning frameworks of what are your reliable sources of income. So then what you can do is you can identify, well, that gap between Social Security and pension and my desired lifestyle, that's my spending gap. So whatever I've saved for retirement, I've got to fill in that gap. So how do I turn my savings into spending and how do I do that as efficiently as possible? Uh, well, this is one strategy to do this. And again, I just want to frame this up for you to start uh, putting your head around the concept. This isn't specific advice to any single one of you because it's going to be different for everybody. But just conceptually, this is how that works. So once you get a handle on what your desired lifestyle costs, I need you to think about What's a general lifestyle or a more basic lifestyle that you're willing to accept? Now, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, just bread and water to keep the lights on. I'm talking about, you know, maybe you decide that you're going to go golfing twice a month instead of twice a week. Uh, perhaps you're going to watch the Food Network and, and recreate some of those recipes at home instead of going to a cooking class. Uh, maybe you start brewing your own coffee at home instead of going to the Starbucks or Caribou or, or whatever the coffee house is by you three four days a week.
Uh, whatever it is, understand what your basic lifestyle is that also still incorporates your health care plan, right? Because then what you're going to need to do is insert from whatever savings you have uh, some sort of guaranteed lifetime income uh, into that. So you've got reliable sources of income meeting your basic lifestyle. Then the gap between your basic lifestyle and your desired lifestyle, that's where you just take simple withdrawals out of whatever savings, other savings you have, your 401k, IRA, the CDs you have at the bank, whatever it is, right? This is important because we want to talk about a concept called ROI, reliability of income. Reliability of income is important because of two things. One, unpredictable markets, and two, unpredictable inflationary periods. Now, I'm sure nobody on this call has uh, ever experienced any unpredictable markets or unpredictable inflationary periods. But for your friends and family who have, this is some good information for them, right? So unpredictable markets. You know, I don't probably need to remind you about those, though, right? This year is a good example. 2008, 2001, bubble burst in the 90s. How about 87, 78? The list goes on and on and on, right? It's not if you're going to run into a bad market while you're retired. It's when, you know, but that shouldn't scare you too much. Because you know, in between those bad times, there's oftentimes a lot of good times. But the reality is, is that you will run into some bad markets while you're retired. They're like bad movies that keep being remade or bad pennies that keep showing up. If you've got reliable sources of income to get you through uh, those unpredictable markets, uh, those will become of more little consequence to you, right? We also talked about it's not if we run into them, but when we run into them. But I don't have a crystal ball, do you? So I don't know when the next one's coming. The only time you can tell, tell that they've been here uh, is that they're gone, right? So if you run into a bad market earlier in your retirement instead of later in your retirement, it's going to have a more significant impact, right? Think about your friends and coworkers who uh, retired maybe in 2006 or 2007. 2008 comes along very early into their retirement and has a significant impact on their retirement lifestyle, maybe so much that they had to go back to work or, or change things around significantly. So you want to have reliable sources of income so that doesn't happen to you. The second thing is unpredictable uh, inflationary periods, right? Many of our kids, grandkids may be uh, uh, astonished what your mortgage rate was back in at 80, 81, 82, 83. Uh, you know, I think my folks were at uh, 16, 16 and a quarter percent, and they were ecstatic when they could buy down to like 14 and a half. Nowadays, people are complaining that, you know, they got four and a half instead of four and an eighth. You will experience high inflationary times again through your retirement, right? But that shouldn't intimidate you all that much either, right? Because during that time, that's also when checking accounts and savings accounts and CDs were paying 7, 8, 9, 10, 12%, right? But if you have reliable sources of income, those unpredictable, uh, unpredictable uh, inflationary periods will be of little consequence to you, right? So if you have an income strategy like this that gives you reliable sources of income that meets your basic lifestyles, uh, with other sources to meet your desired lifestyle, it will allow you to sleep better at night and live better during the day, knowing that unpredictable markets and unpredictable inflationary periods will be of little consequence to you, right? During good years, you'll be living the great life. During bad years, you'll still be living the good life because you have those reliable sources of income meeting your basic lifestyle needs. Can you see how this stuff all starts to fill together? It's not any one component, it's all five of them feeding together. Right? It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be hard. It can be very simple as long as you uh, get some help in, in putting this stuff together. Right. So the key activities in income are this: one, identify all of your income sources. You know, Social Security, pensions. If you've got some annuities out there, um, just what are your four hundred one k's? What, whatever it might be, identify the sources of income that you have. Identify the sources of income that your spouse has. Right. You want to explore spousal Social Security benefits as well. Uh, Second, understand your payout options. If you do have uh, pension benefits or some sort of annuity benefits, there's going to be all this new vocabulary that gets thrown at you. Life, joint life, uh, survivor life, life with period certain. Um, get some help if you don't understand what that terminology is because all too often we see people get to the brink of frustration. They just kind of throw up their hands and go, you know what, I'm just going to check the highest box. And that can be a detrimental uh, decision, especially if you're married, uh, because you know, oftentimes just checking the highest box only covers one person, right? So understand your different payout options. If you don't have anybody to turn to, please turn to us. Uh, we're here to help as well. Third, evaluate how you'll create a strategy for a lifetime of income, 
right? Create a strategy for a lifetime of income. The decision that you need to make here is this, is what's the right amount of guaranteed income that I need to recreate for myself and how am I gonna put that into place? What's the right amount of guaranteed income for me and how am I gonna put it into place, right? That's not a cookie cutter approach that we just discussed. It's gonna be different for everybody. Some of you may not need to recreate any more of your guaranteed lifetime income. Some of you may need to create a substantial amount of guaranteed lifetime income. The point is, is that you need to figure out what that right amount is for you. And your action step when it comes to figuring out how, this, how you're gonna whole recreate this income uh, in retirement is this, is please get a second opinion. Uh, I would hate to see a rounding error cost you 10 years worth of income, right? Please get some help with this stuff. If nothing else, then just to, assume, just to make sure that your assumptions are correct, right? I know that you guys spend a lot of time uh, probably throughout the course of your careers doing a lot of number crunching and analysis and things like that. It always makes sense to have a lot of different simulations run for you and to test those theories to make sure that they're as accurate and predictable as can be. So we, we began the conversation with talking about what your vision of retirement is going to be like, right? That we want to pull it back to that. You know, are you going to spend time cooking? Perhaps you're going to spend your time relaxing. Maybe you're going to get to that traveling that you didn't get a chance to do. Heck, you might get a chance to sit down and actually read some of those books you have sitting in your bookshelves that you meant to get to. Whatever it is, retirement and your retirement vision is all about you. But whatever that vision is, it's supported by those five areas. What's your lifestyle, your, in, uh, your investments, your health care, your protection, and your income. All five of those things play a key role, and we believe you need good answers in all five of those areas, right? Which will ultimately lead you down to these four things. How are you gonna go about and recreate uh, your benefits? How are you gonna recreate uh, your safety nets? How are you gonna recreate your paycheck? How are you gonna recreate your investment approach, right? By having solid answers to these, it will help you to get to that point of answering the simply a challenging question, can I afford to retire? If not now, how? Uh, if not now, when? And if now, how the heck do I do it? So uh, retirement is all we do. We retire all day, every day. Right? That's what we're here to help, help folks with. Right? So uh, in appreciation uh, of sitting, uh, sitting through me yap at you here for the past 40, 45 minutes, you're entitled to a couple of things for us to help you out with. Right? Uh, we have a dedicated team of retirement professionals. Uh, and let me just introduce you to them really quickly conceptually, right? Uh, these are retirement planning uh, professionals, not retirement sales professionals, right? So this is a salaried group of people that don't work on commissions or anything like that. They're objective, uh, objective experienced, credentialized, and knowledgeable. Uh, all of them have a charter retirement planning counselor designation or a certified financial planning counselor designation because we believe also that, you know, you need to keep up to date and, and, and schooled on these types of concepts if you're going to be providing uh, planning support and help to individuals. Uh, we're extremely accessible, meaning you don't have to hop in your car, sit through traffic, sit in our lobby and drink bad coffee for a half hour before you get a chance to talk with us. Uh, we do all of our stuff via the phone uh, and interactions like this via webinars, right? So you can be in the comfort of your home, you might be in your office, you might be in your car, whatever it is, we meet you on your terms, we don't lock you into our office and and enforce you anything you don't want to be into, right? So it's all about you and helping you, uh, helping you plan. It's not about product, it's about planning. So get in touch with us uh, and you can get a couple of things to help you answer that question, can I afford to retire? If not now, when? And if now, how? So if you want to know, can you afford to retire? We can run a customized retirement spending report for you. So basically, five five easy uh, pieces of information for you to give us. Uh, we can give you what a sustainable spending number is for you. So you can uh, answer that question for yourself. Can you afford to do this? Uh, so don't have to be bashful, don't have to be ashamed. Um, this is all about planning. You know, We don't indict people if they got started saving a little bit later. It's all about what your options are now, right? So you wanna know how much you can sustainably spend? We can tell you. Do you wanna know how to retire? Right? We've identified there's really about 25 decisions that people need to make if they want to know that they've got a plan uh, that they can be confident with and comfortable with that can change with them throughout their course of retirement. Most people don't know what those things are. or If they do, they don't know where to begin. Well, you no longer need to worry about that because we'll provide you with a customized retirement checklist, which makes it so easy. 
right? All we need is when you, uh, you to tell us when you estimate you want to retire, we'll tell you what you need to do and when you need to do it by. So you can bite these things off in chunks and feel like you're organized going into this thing. If you just have questions about any of the five key areas, you know, what should I do with this uh, old Roth account I have out there? Or what the heck is this investment option that I have? You know, should I take Social Security? How do I recreate my, my health care benefits with this whole Medicare thing? If you have just questions about that, we're here as a resource for you. Uh, consultations are complimentary. There's no obligation, right? So now, hopefully, we've raised, uh, raised the bar a little bit. We've moved people from that anxious and intimidated level at least to a little bit more confident and a little bit more excited, especially as it relates to recreating your paycheck and recreating your health care benefits. Right, helping people retire, that's what we do. We wanna help people make wise decisions about their retirement resources so they can find a lifestyle that meets their goals and objectives, right? So here is our phone number, it's 866-368-0564, uh, extension 37127 will help us to identify that uh, that is coming from you. Uh, and we're here to help. So uh, give us a call uh, and next week, let's set up some time with one of our retirement professionals to get you your customized spending report, to get you your retirement checklist, to answer your questions so you're comfortable and confident about this. Uh, so I want to leave the balance of our time to answer any questions we have. You'll see that there's a live chat down there. We've got a, a couple of them that, that have come in and uh, we'll do our best to answer some of these. If some of them do get pretty specific, I may just direct you right to our advisor team to, to, to answer that, but we'll, we'll do the best we can with the, uh, with the group in the, in the crowd now. So. Uh, the first one I see, I'm 65 plus one month, not retiring uh, until the minimum 69. My HR says, uh, I don't need to sign up for Medicare until retirement. Is that right? Uh, potentially. What they're basically saying is you probably want to enroll in Medicare Part A, but Medicare Part B, you can defer enrolling in that, right? And this is an important, uh, this is an important thing to talk about. Right, so if you're Medicare eligible and you're still working, you can elect not to start receiving Part B benefits um, so that when you do actually retire, you can, you can turn on those retiree benefits. Uh, you can turn on Part B benefits without incurring uh, an increase in premium. So for example, uh, let's take a look at the alternative situation. So let's say somebody retires and they say, I don't want to pay for Part B, so I'm only going to go into Part A. Well, a few years go by and they go, you know what, I think I do need Part B now. Um, if you are retired and defer taking Part B, there's a 10% penalty per year on how much it's going to cost you. So if it's supposed to be $115 a month, the next, uh, the next year, if you didn't take it, it'll be 10% more than that. So what about $136 a month? If you did it, delay it again, now you're talking about 140, 150. So you're right. Uh, uh, it, if you're still working, you don't need to take Part B, but I'd still encourage you probably to take Part A. Um, work with them and double check and see what uh, see if that's the right thing for you. Uh, did that answer your question? A simple yes or no. We'll, uh, we'll get that because I want to make sure that you're you're taken care of. Next, uh, what type of plan to retire? Uh, what if you plan to retire to a new lower paying career or pursuit? Can you help with that type of transition? Uh, absolutely, right? Uh, oftentimes people work in retirement because it allows them to be retired because now they're taking on an opportunity that, um, you know, they, they can find a new profession that allows them to be retired because they don't have to find one that is sustaining of a career, right? So if you're looking at continuing to work as part of your uh, plan in retirement, we can certainly help you figure out how that piece of the puzzle fits in. Um, and it's very easy, and there's a lot of there's a couple of extra steps you need to go to. Uh, so if that's you, Ralph, I, I would very much encourage you to call call one of our folks, set up a time, and talk about that transition plan. So it can be very simple, easy, and painless for you, and uh, you don't step into a couple of the potholes that are out there. So uh, you really need you really need to have a consultation with, with one of our folks uh, because they help people with it all the time. Uh, okay, so so back to our our Medicare plan. So let me see if I can if I can frame this up a little bit. So no. Uh, why not continue with my company provided a hospitalization coverage? Uh, you know, th th that's a good question. And perhaps, perhaps your employer um, has, one of the, has a very more specialized plan. Uh, most of the ones I've commonly seen 
um, still encourage you to enroll in, in Part A. Uh, because if your Part A benefits, uh, or if your company provider benefits uh, are better than what the basic A coverage is, obviously you would still want to maintain um, maintain your your Part A coverage. Uh, but since that's a that's a pre pretty specific what's about a, what's available to you, uh, I would encourage you have a quick review with one of our group, uh, one of our guys from our group who deal with that stuff every day to give you the ins and outs of that and, and why or, or why not that that would be better for. What other questions uh, do you have? Well, Bob, this is Daryl. Uh, can y'all hear me? Uh, I don't see any more questions. I don't see any more questions, and uh, I think this has been a very uh, informative webinar. We can give it one more uh, minute to see if anyone has any more questions. That sounds great. And if you do have questions after this, there's our phone number. There's the extension. Those are the best people to talk to because those are the people that help help everybody do this uh, in and out every day. Uh, they have a lot of expertise in that stuff. They're here as a benefit and it's available to you. Uh, so I encourage you to, to, to leverage that. No obligation out of that stuff. It's, it's purely a resource to you because, okay. because of who uh, uh, IEEE is. Well, thanks, Bob, so much. Uh, for those, yes, we will be had. We'll be putting this webinar up in our archive webinar in about 48 to 72 hours. And also, we will have the slide presentation there for you as well. And, uh, Bob, we thank you and Transamerica for uh, putting on this webinar. And um, that's about it. Thanks so much. We'll be ending the webinar. Bye-bye.